Good morning and welcome to Bible study at Grace Lutheran Church in School Grace. See all of you here this morning. Thank you also to those who will be watching um, on the line. Let's pray and get started in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we thank and praise you that you've given us your holy word, which contains all kinds of guidance uh, for and instructions, even for worship. Bless us as we study that. And by your spirit, give us wisdom so we can understand what you're communicating in your word to us, uh, that we may follow it uh, by your grace. Forgive us for uh, falling short, for taking a consumer approach to worship, uh, desiring that we should have things our way. So give us a spirit of humility as we come before you so that we would offer up our praise and thanksgiving with joyful hearts in return for all you've done for us in Christ. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, very good. We are on page 548 in the textbook. The section is called Growing Through Worship. It's in a section on using the Bible or the Bible related to worship. The textbook is called The Lutheran Difference. This is a phenomenal book available from Concordia Publishing House, cph.org. They'll send it right to your house. It has a different cover now. This was uh, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation edition. Uh, it's got a different cover now, but uh, same content. What it does, this, this book goes through the major doctrines of the faith, explains them from the Bible, and compares what Lutherans believe to other major denominations. And that makes it really helpful in conversations with family members and friends. So it's really good to have. All right, growing through um, worship. Uh, the book makes a really, really interesting statement right at the beginning. How do Christians learn to worship? For many, our education occurs simply through the divine services we have attended. So we learn about worship by worshiping with God's people. That's a huge point. Uh, the, the body of Christ, the church, 1 Corinthians 12 language there, the body of Christ, the church, uh, or the assembly, as Hebrews calls it, um, is a, um, a community formed by the word and forming toward each other. So it, that's why, for example, we don't have a children's anything during church because church is where the children belong. They belong in the divine service. This is where they watch their parents worship. They watch the people around them worship. They learn how we do worship. Um, they learn that worship is for all ages, um, that it's not something where, well, okay, we're going to dodge this for now and go have playtime so that later we're groomed into the understanding that worship should be pleasing or I won't go, that kind of thing. The children are in worship. They need to see that God is for all people from cradle to grave. And, uh, and learn the ins and the outs. They need help being guided through the use of a hymnal or other resources, visual resources that are available, uh, and all of that kind of thing. One of the things I love about school chapel, we have a school here at Grace, one, one of the things I love about school chapel on Wednesdays is that all of the little ones, no matter what their church background or no church background at all, they all very quickly memorize the service. And so as we go through, they do have, you know, we, we call out the page number, please turn to page 184, Divine Service Setting 3, that kind of thing. Um, but they don't need it. If, if for whatever reason, you know, they, I don't know, they played in the mud, they had muddy hands, I don't know, whatever. If they couldn't use the hymnals, they wouldn't need them. Uh, because even these little bitty ones, even little ones who can't read, can go through the entire service of the word. And um, that's really awesome. That's when worship uh, becomes a part of you. Um, and, and as we've been talking, the divine service is drawn from the Bible. It either quotes the Bible or paraphrases the Bible, but it's the Bible. And it's the word of God, and it's wording you, and it's catechetical, it's teaching you, and have the little ones taught in the presence of their parents and grandparents, for example, and their church family. Um, it really forms tight bonds of community. It helps the kids understand that they belong. It helps prepare them for leadership later in the church and all kinds of wonderful things. So it's a really big deal, big, big deal to have the children uh, in worship. Some places do a children's sermon, and that's fine. I've done that before. 
Um, I stopped during the pandemic and just sort of haven't picked it up again. Um, I It's six of one, half a dozen the other, whether or not you have that children's sermon because it's the parent's duty to explain what's going on to the children. Uh, it's not the church's job to entertain anybody, including children. It's the parent's job to say, here's what was going on today. And I try to have elements in every sermon that are approachable across a spectrum of developmental ability and ages and context and so forth. It's impossible to, for one person to deliver a sermon that somehow is just, you know, it's the Goldilocks sermon, just right for everybody. Um, there's no such thing, and that's not the point of a sermon. Um, actually, the law portion of a sermon should make us feel uncomfortable, not comfortable. <laughs> but uh, you get the idea. Uh, the Word of God is for all ages. The core concepts are available to be grasped by people of uh, all ages and so forth. So, yeah. Um, God gives us his word. We respond to him with his word. That's how the divine service works. We don't say random stuff. Uh, we don't say uh, kind of whatever's on our heart. There's nothing wrong with that. But for a congregational setting where order is important, um, we have responses to say drawn from Holy Scripture so that now not only is God wording us and we're responding to him with his word, but in responding with his word, we're wording each other. We're literally gospeling each other. Uh, that's why I love congregational singing. That's why I love lyrics that have law and gospel content, focus on Christ and the cross and sin and so forth, uh, redemption, so that we can gospel each other throughout uh, the divine service. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Uh, the book says, is the great commission of Jesus um, to his church? You know, some people uh, like or dislike that sort of title, great commission thing. I'm not a huge fan, but that's what the book says. Uh, Jesus to his church. In verse 18, we find the invocation, the words used at the beginning of our worship service. In other words, we call upon the name of the Lord. Who's the Lord? Well, he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, that's also why we say that at the beginning. It's also why we make the sign of the cross, because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is our God who has made himself known to us in Christ. So the cross, we make the sign of the cross. It's also remembrance of, uh, of baptism. And I always encourage people, do that. Do make the sign of the cross. Um, it doesn't matter. People always say, what, what shoulder do I land on? Uh, you know, there's, there's nowhere in the Bible that says make the cross like this. Um, Roman Catholics tend to land on the right shoulder, just my right shoulder, on the right shoulder, because uh, that's your sword arm, the arm of power, and so forth. That's the raw, you know. Um, and Lutherans tend to land on the left shoulder because your heart is actually offset a little bit closer to the left, your hands ending over your heart. Um, yeah, whatever. Uh, just uh, the big thing for me is not the the direction of the motion or whatever, it's, it's, it's great to do these little mnemonics that help remind us of who we are, who we belong to, and what's up, right? And who we are as Christians, who we belong to is Christ, and what's up is the cross, where he paid for our sins uh, so we can be forgiven. So that's a really great thing to do. Matthew 15, 22 records the words of a Canaanite woman, the book says, Mark 10, 47, those of Bartimaeus, a blind man, calling out, Lord, have mercy. Uh, so this is the Kyrie eleison, uh, which in Greek means Lord have mercy. Uh, and we say it three times, Trinitarian. We generally say Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. And that's one of the oldest parts of Christian uh, liturgy. You can find that in, in uh, documents and fragments and letters going uh, back as pretty much as far as we have those kinds of, of documents. Uh, Luke 2, 14 records the song of the angels at Jesus' birth. Glory to God in the highest. Uh, so we sing the glory and excelsis Deo, glory to God in the highest. That's Latin. Um, again, near the beginning of the service. And you'll notice that the service sort of, sort of uh, reenacts the divine drama of Jesus' earthly ministry. Kind of, you know, you have calling upon the name of the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have a uh, curie, Lord have mercy. Then, Glory to God in the highest he's been born. And then it carries all the way through 
the Last Supper, uh, death and resurrection, and all and all of that. And you'll see that as we kind of continue through uh, the worship service. Um, Revelation 5, 8 to 14 is repeated uh, in the song, Worthy is Christ. Uh, people know that more popularly uh, as this is the feast. This is the feast of victory for our God. Hallelujah. Um, worthy is that song, that, that hymn draws heavily on revelation imagery and language. Uh, so it's pretty cool as well. Um, in John 6, 68, uh, we sing that as part of the um, Alleluia. Uh, so, and that is, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. In some versions, we, are, we have five service settings in our hymnal, the Lutheran service book. Uh, some have that, some don't. Um, some have, some Alleluia settings have a verse that changes in the middle. Uh, some don't. Um, another passage of scripture used as an offertory during Lent is, what shall I render to the Lord? Uh, that's based on Psalm um, 116. Otherwise, uh, we tend to use the standard offertory for most of the years from Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Just straight up um, scripture. Uh, Matthew 6 the words of the Lord, Lord's Prayer, it's also found in Luke 11, but we use the Matthew 6, the, the longer form uh, for, the, uh, for the Lord's Prayer. Um, and uh, Isaiah 6, holy, 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 uh, also found in Matthew 21, uh, are in the Sanctus, which is Latin for holy. We sing that um, as well. In singing the Sanctus, we bring in those words of Matthew 21. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's from the triumphal entry. Hosanna uh, in the highest. Uh, a little bit later, we also sing the, uh, the Agnus Dei, the Lamb, Latin for Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist said that. John 1, 29, and I think 36 as well. He says it twice. Uh, as Colossians 1, 20 tells us, he has made peace by the blood of uh, his cross. And then after communion, uh, we do the canticle or song of Simeon, Luke 2, uh, 29 to 32. We call it the Nunc Dimittis, Latin for now dismiss. Lord, now that your servant depart in peace, according to your word, yeah, et cetera. So as you can see, and we could go in much more detail. And in fact, upstairs in the sanctuary, we have laminated cards that do exactly that. They literally go line by line and tell you from Scripture, where do all these things come from? This is an overview. The point being that the divine service is not a consumer product designed to please people. And, and, and that's why we don't tinker with it and certainly not under those kinds of that kind of idea. We wouldn't do that. Um, there is no particular mandate in the New Testament, for example, of how New Testament worship is supposed to go. We have clues. We draw on the history from the Old Testament, understanding that that's been fulfilled in Christ. We draw on existing synagogue worship at that time, first century, so on and so forth. Um, so, but there, so while there's not a mandate, that doesn't mean it doesn't matter. We talked about this in the section on Adiaphora. God is a God of order. And so the divine service, which has been developed over across 2,000 years and really isn't very different today than what it was in the first century, has been specifically designed to speak back to God and to each other his promises, um, his words. And it does a great job uh, of doing that. People who come along today with the latest fad or trend in worship do not know more than 2,000 years of church history under rock solid theologians, they just don't. So um, it's a really good idea to not tinker around with that. All right, uh, the more familiar we are with the Bible, the more use it will be in our lives. The book says in the section from the heart on page uh, 550, that's absolutely true. The more you know the Bible, the more it will become a part of you. That's why it's always good to be in the word. Um, the advantage, one of the advantages of having a cell phone for all of its disadvantages, one of the advantages is no matter where you are or how much time you have, you can pull up a little scripture. 
And if you keep a tab open, if you wanted to read through the Bible and read through on your phone, you can do a little bit at a time until you're done. Or if you have a particular book, chapter, whatever, but it's really good to keep scripture um, in front of you. Keep If you want, if you like, I love physical books. So keep it near your bed, keep it at your work. You know, have a couple copies, three, four floating around the house. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, liturgical texts we've all we've looked at are all part of the the ordinary. It's called book says at the bottom of five fifty. Uh, these are words that are repeated week after week in the divine service. The repetition of text does not mean that worship is always the same. What we've looked at are the repeating parts, kind of the core. Uh, the, the, the bones of the service, the repeating parts of worship. Uh, but every week, the propers change. There's a different collect or prayer. Uh, there is a different psalm that is used responsively. Uh, there are three different major readings, Old Testament, Epistle, and Gospel. Uh, the gradual, which is a transition verse or two between uh, the Old Testament and the Epistle, that can change usually seasonally. Uh, the songs change. So um, when someone comes and says, why do we always do the same old thing? It tells me that they're not really paying attention <laughs> to what's going on uh, because uh, a whole bunch of things change every week. And not only do they change, but they change with purpose. They don't change for the sake of changing. They change because the theme of each Sunday changes. And so the prayers and the gradual and the and the, the readings and so forth and the hymns all home in on a central theme that we're covering for that uh, that day. So it's it's carefully constructed and constructed with a purpose, and a whole bunch of it changes uh, every Sunday. Uh, the scripture readings, sermon, prayers, songs, and other elements are constantly changing. Forgot about that. The sermon obviously changes. Uh, in this way, the service provides a balance of familiar and the changeable. Okay? Um, it's fairly common, the, the uh, last paragraph, 551, before the new section, Digging Deeper, it's fairly common for Lutherans to describe these elements as Lutheran worship, but these are not Lutheran texts, nor are they German texts or even European or Western texts, right? These classic liturgical texts belong to the whole church, that's the whole church all over the world, and have been in use for most of the history of the Christian church. These texts are freely used in other churches. Orthodox, Roman, Roman Catholics, Episcopalians, and other liturgical churches use uh, essentially the same words we do. A lot of the same responses, the liturgies are incredibly similar. Um, a person visiting from one of those other traditions I would feel very at home in a Lutheran church. We kind of would know what's going on. So, uh, all right, um, let's take a look at the Psalms of in worship over on page um, 553. I just want to show you that this chart is here because it's really helpful. Um, there are different kinds of Psalms, and they are addressing different kinds of ritual acts like pilgrimage uh, or procession, you know. Uh, when the Israelites would make their pilgrimage to the temple, they would always say, let us go up to the temple. And no matter which direction you came from, you're always going up because it's up on a mountain. So you're going up to the temple. Procession. Um, there's dancing. Uh, there's entrance liturgies, invocation, versicle and response, and all of this. Uh, I just want you to know that that is there. And uh, take a moment and kind of look through that at some point uh, because that's, that's really an awesome thing. All right, um, that brings us to the end um, of worship. Let's look at um, comparisons with other uh, denominations on page 552. Not, um, not by denomination, but conceptual comparisons, and we'll kind of address where these things happen. Use of the Lord's Prayer as a model. Um, Anabaptists, Baptists, and some Wesleyans emphasize that Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer as, as a model and not a form of prayer or repetition, they encourage spontaneous prayers from the heart rather than repeated prayers. So I also encourage spontaneous prayer from the heart. But remember what Paul said in the section when he's speaking on tongues, 
And he doesn't want everybody just going off in their own direction at all at the same time and making chaos, right? Uh, in worship, uh, for congregational use, it's better to have ordered prayer. Um, now, you, if you've been to Haiti, we've made tons of trips to Haiti to work in Haiti, not since the assassination of the president, but prior to that, uh, and we're hoping to go back as soon as things can get settled. You'll notice there during the church service, at the time of the prayer of the church, which is very ordered here in America, that they, they do some, and then they have, they just kind of turn it loose, and everybody sort of lifts their prayers and petitions to God all at the same time. That's kind of a cultural thing, and for them, it works, and somehow it doesn't at all disturb or bother them that everybody is saying their own thing and out loud all at the same time, and this goes on for quite a time. They'll pray and pray and pray and pray, and, and that's fine, so I would never want to say, oh, you can't do that. Um, what I'm saying is, is that it's not an either or, it's a false dichotomy to say the Lord's Prayer is not to be repeated because the apostles said, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, say. So clearly it's not just an example. He intended us to pray uh, that prayer. Formal use of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, most other Christians pray the Lord's Prayer daily or frequently in public worship. The official catechisms of the Eastern Orthodox, Lutheran, Reformed, and Roman Catholic churches contain commentaries on the Lord's Prayer. Repetition is only a problem if people repeat the words without considering what they say. Jesus himself repeated prayers. See, for example, Matthew 26, verse 44. Um, and this really brings up a good point, and it's a good answer for people who say, why do we say the same things? That's boring. Well, first of all, I understand. Second of all, that's a consumer statement, and we're not consumers of worship. We're worshiping people of God. Um, with regard to saying the same thing being boring, I submit to you that it will never get old or your parents, or your siblings, or your spouse, or your kids, or your best friends, it will never get old for them to keep saying, I love you. And I really doubt that anybody says to a loved one, why do you keep saying the same words, I love you? That's boring, right? So the issue is not in saying the same words. The issue is in the heart, of the one wanting to be pleased or have something new for the sake of something new, you know, show me the money, right? Or whatever, you want that flash in the pan before experience, that's the issue. The issue is our flesh. The issue is not saying the same words. The fact is, I love you, we'll never get old and none of us can ever hear it enough. That's for sure. All right, um, prayer with non-Christians. Today, some Christians hold public prayer services with people of other religions. Interreligious services are most popular among Christians who have questioned traditional beliefs about the triune nature of God and do not consider joint services with non-Christians a threat to the gospel. Uh, take note, in 1964, the papal decree Lumen Gentium uh, taught that Christians, Jews, and Muslims all pray to the same creator. And of course, they don't. Um, the Christian God, Yahweh, uh, Lord of hosts, is the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, triune, and who sent Jesus, God the Son, in the flesh, suffer and die on the cross, and, and, and be raised from the dead for our salvation. Um, the Jewish God did not do that, has not done that. They're still looking for a Messiah. The Muslim God is Allah, not Yahweh, uh, and also did not do that. Uh, so, uh, no, uh, technically, no, that's not the same God. We are not um, praying. Uh, and, and for that matter, uh, and be careful about how you say this, but around anybody, but uh, also, the, uh, the Latter-day Saints God is a very different God than the God of Orthodox Christianity. Uh, so don't go out and hurt people with that, okay? But um, just kind of be aware. 
So what do we do? Um, as a pastor, uh, I do not participate in public prayer services up front where there is the potential to give the public impression of agreement where there is not agreement and where there's the potential to say, well, disagreement doesn't matter. Christianity is basically a, a belief buffet and you can kind of just pick and choose from what you like, no big deal. Um, because all of that would be false. That's not true. Um, so um, in, in private matters, um, where I know the people well enough, um, I will generally, well, generally, everyone asks me to do the prayer anyway, so I'm covered. Uh, but um, if for some reason I'm, I'm not, for example, when I go to lunch with my buddies who are Wisconsin Senate or Evangelical Lutheran Senate pastors, there are different branches of Lutheranism, and their, their branches do not allow them to pray publicly with anybody outside of their branch. Um, they have a thing called prayer fellowship that we can get into at some time, but not today. So when I go to lunch with them, I ask them to pray. And I can give my assent and my amen to their prayer because we believe fundamentally all of the same things with a few exceptions that we as LCMS Lutherans would consider applications of doctrine rather than actual doctrinal differences. That's a whole thing we can get into sometime as well. I'm just giving an example. Um, so, uh, and, and I, had the, I had the occasion recently where I had to kind of draw the line. Um, I was asked to be the celebrant of a memorial ser service on the steps of the state capitol uh, in Salt Lake City in memoriam because the Utah trigger laws are stalled in court um, to, uh, to prevent abortion and so forth. And uh, they're stalled. And so the, the, the Pro-Life Utah was going to have a, or have a memorial service um, for all those who, infants who will die until the trigger laws can take effect. And I was asked to be the celebrant, which I was willing to do. And then I started to think about, thought, hmm, I maybe ought to know what I'm saying yes to. <laughs> and so I asked them to send me an outline of the service. As it turned out, uh, there was supposed to be an opening prayer, an invocation led by an LDS bishop, followed by a public prayer uh, by a Roman Catholic priest, and so forth. And all of this was sort of mixed together. I love them. And uh, I go to lunch with them and hang out and, and, and love them to pieces and all of that as people. But I can't give the public impression that the differences between those things don't matter because they do. That, by the way, is why denominations exist. And I know some people say, well, that's why I'm non-denom. We don't have labels. Non-denominational is a label. And it is separate because on purpose. It's not Lutheran, for example. It's not Roman Catholic. It's non-denominational on purpose because of differences that do matter, which is why there's separation. Uh, so I don't give the impression, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just sort of a double standard to be of X, but then give the public impression that, well, Y and Z are equal as well. Well, then why aren't you them? There's kind of an issue there. So uh, anyway, that's how we handle that. All right, very good. Um, any questions about worship? about public prayer or anything in this unit so far, because we have reached the end of this unit. We're not going to start end times today. I don't want to just barely get into it and then have to, you know, so that's going to come, God willing, next week. But what about worship? Questions about worship, songs, things we do, things other people do, prayer, anything from this unit? Yes. How about processing with the cross? Yeah. And, and historically and how, why that's, why we do that now, whereas maybe we didn't do it as much in the past. We who? Oh, well, I guess Grace? LCMS. LCMS always has. Okay. So, well, I mean, it has, but it hasn't. No, I mean, it, it, it was taken out of this for a I, Yeah, I don't mean all congregations, yeah. um, but the procession of the cross historically comes from the Catholic Mass, which precedes Lutheranism, and that we have that is because, yeah. And that's a reminder, is it, to that our focus needs to be on the cross? And yeah, so, um, so it means a lot of things, right? 
why do does anyone process ever? Well, because it signals, wow, something big and important is, is happening here. The cross itself, and we use a crucifix because I, I prefer that. I think that's most appropriate, is because it's signaling the start of worship, the entrance. You know, uh, I think uh, I've seen a lot and a lot of places where the pastor carries um, a Bible or carries the, the altar book with the readings, or kind of the word of God is you know, kind of entering this place. Um, it has tons and tons of very good, very solid symbolic meaning. Um, and um, I have seen it done more than not done. Um, even though, you know, I, I was a convert in 1990, uh, but yeah, I've, I, it's, it's a rare thing that in my experience, it's rare to not see it done. And I would tend to associate not doing it with maybe less liturgically invested congregations. Um, one place I can think of, you know, had communion twice a month, not every Sunday, just kind of, there was just a lower view of liturgy. Um, it doesn't mean there's something wrong necessarily if it's not done. Um, but for example, every service I ever attended at the seminary, they processed the crucifix. Um, and um, there's a reason why the seminary does that. <laughs> and if you watch, watch, you know, Fort Wayne or St. Louis, watch them online, you'll, you'll, you'll see that there's a, 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 a reverence um, for um, for the formality. You're, you know, your worship should have a sense of awe about it and seriousness. Um, and that's why I always tell people, you know, um, don't come in with you know with your your coffee and your bagel or muffin or whatever like you're you're hitting the movies. You got your popcorn and your soda. That's not what this is. Um, there's plenty of time to drink that before, eat that before finish in the narthex, whatever, you know, prefer that we treat this with a sense of awe and, and reverence. We've lost too much of that. And um, we don't tend to realize it, but when we go more and more casual, more and more, we're actually, we're actually sort of confessing our views of God. That we're getting more casual with God. And that's something that him and I kind of brought up this morning because he's like, yeah, you're overdressed every Sunday. You always dress nice, and you're yeah. like going to some good for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yes, and, yes. You know, holidays, Christmas, yeah. Easter, Thanksgiving. Yeah. You know, even though it was just a family dinner, I was always dressed nice. Yes, That's yeah, I was right. Yeah, I do the same in our house. So if it's Easter, Christmas, whatever, family dinner, I go downstairs, put on a button up, and come upstairs. And you just, um, it, it really signals this is important to me. Um, now, it doesn't mean that someone can't come to church in what they have, right? There was a time early in, in uh, our marriage where my wife and I were so poor that we only owned a pair of jeans and, you know, and a couple of shirts or whatever. And that's all we had. That was our Sunday best. And I remember attending um and um someone on one of the first day or two Sundays or two of attending someone took us aside and just want to let you know you know we don't wear jeans here you know we don't do that and so after that of course we made a point because once someone has made it a law that you can't um that, that is not a law so we did not that we could have done anything about it financially for a long time anyway because that's all we could afford but um yeah, and we parked our, we had a 73 charger held together by rust. And he had to always drive around even in the winter with the windows down because the exhaust fumes came up through the holes in the floor and gasket. <laughs> and so we made sure we parked it next to the Mercedes and BMW and all of that at the church. So. But um, um, and very carefully got out, though. There's no banging doors, you know. But I mean, we're going to park right next because they, they needed it to learn some important lessons about love. But um, yeah, uh, it, it is whatever your best is. And you'll see this in Haiti. Here's a country, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, and they can only wear yard sale clothes from America that people buy in bulk and put in, in trash bags, send over and resell. 
they will go to the creek or the river and they will hand wash and get their shirts crisp and white as I mean crazy crisp and white like we I can't do with our washing machine here at home. Uh, dress shoes, whether they fit or not, is immaterial. They'll have hurt and feet, and, but they're wearing dress shoes to church, pants, whatever. And the ladies are in long dresses and they wear veils covering their hair. And every, I mean, wow, it's really, really something to the extent that we have to tell American groups going over, by the way, you're going to have to wear Sunday, school, Sunday clothes, you know, Sunday ladies in skirts, men in slacks, not jeans, not, not uh, your guess. plumber's pants or whatever. Um, yeah, because we have to tell Americans that because the Haitians have that sense of awe and reverence, they're dirt poor, they have nothing, very little material, um, but man, they're coming to church and thanking God for their many blessings, and they're going to deck it out the best they, they no can. No matter how hot it is, too. Yes, it can be a million degrees, and frequently is, and they're in the suit coat and the tie and the full dress and just sweating bus buckets and wiping the Heads, because obviously there's no air conditioning. There's generally no windows. You're just blah, Caribbean hot and uh, blotting your face with a, and, uh, and the divine service is about three hours wow. uh, because a good hour of that is the sermon. A good hour of that is praying, is giving thanks to God for the, for the very little that they compared to us materially. They consider themselves rich in blessings and they're gonna they're gonna give thanks and it'll go man and it'll go and it'll go and it'll, and when they sing they're gonna sing every verse and there might be two or three opening hymns and there might be two or three closing hymns and they're filled with joy and they're gonna sing yeah it's um it always cracks me up when somebody says service was an hour and a half today <laughs> i i'm so sorry and the I'm, kids sit through it in haiti too they I mean, oh yeah the kids sit. yeah the kids sit and they don't but no. you know no there's no running around there's no yelling and goofing there's none of that no no it's no, impressive no. yeah 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 but um yeah we, we we complain about an hour and a half in a climate control sanctuary with padded seats um they will um uh, just in blistering heat and sweating buckets uh, belt out uh, to the Lord for a good three, a good three hours. Uh, you're doing good if you get out of there in three hours. But anyway, anyway, cultural differences, yeah, and uh, first world problems and spoiled Americans. Okay, all right. Uh, let's uh, hey, let's wrap it up. Nine seventeen. Time to get upstairs, and I have uh, somebody to speak with quickly before uh, we do the service. So let's call it next week, the Lord willing. We're going to start the section on the end times. Uh, so this would be really good to read in advance and get kind of a little handle on what's going on there. I just finished teaching Revelation at uh, our mission in Spanish Fork. Uh, so I'll be bringing in some extra material to clarify things. But this is a big deal and something Christians always wonder about. So uh, feel free to bring folks and, uh, and we'll help them out as much as possible. Yeah, let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we thank and praise you. Uh, that you're good and gracious and merciful and, and put up with us. We thank you most of all that you gave up your only son, Jesus, onto the cross to save us from our sins. We thank you for saving faith in him that you've granted through your word and sacraments that we may be forgiven and saved. Now strengthen this faith, we pray, uh, through the gifts that you uh, are giving us and grant that we would be eager to return, to give thanks and praise and be among uh, the assembly of your people. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great day in the Lord. God willing, see you soon. Bye-bye.